Yeah, thanks so much for the nice introduction. It was very nice. Um, and it's an uh, honor to give this talk at this workshop. So my, <clears throat> my talk will be about the uh, targeted learning, uh, the bridge from machine learning to statistical and causal inference. There we go. Yeah, so the first thing is why, uh, why do we need anything else than maybe traditional statistics? And for that, you can kind of see how traditional statistics is generally done. Uh, it's very much, as you can see from this little uh, uh, table, uh, people respond to the type of data, uh, if it is a binary outcome, logistic regression, if it is a survival outcome with censoring, you use cox coordinate hazards, uh, and so on. Uh, so there is this uh, weird kind of knee-jerk response uh, to type of data, while in fact we should be talking about the actual experiment which generated data, what do we know about it and what are we trying to learn? And so that whole dialogue is not part of the traditional paramedic models. And beyond that, it relies uh, on these simple models uh, like linear regression or something to be um, correctly specified. And so as a consequence, if you think about confidence intervals, uh, they will, due to the bias, they will narrow, uh, get narrower and narrower as sample size increases around something which is wrong. And so the coverage will go to zero. Uh, and similarly, uh, the type one error for testing a null hypothesis, you know, you can think about, <clears throat> we'll do an example in a moment, uh, where you're interested in some kind of causal effect of some uh, binary treatment on some outcome, uh, like death a month from now, and the treatment might be some steroid or not, on sepsis type patients. And if this is an observational study, uh, and you use then logistic regression, and you say, yeah, I'm going to adjust for confounders, uh, which you measure it uh, when they come in, they have all these uh, markers, then you know. Uh, by putting them in as main terms, you, you wonder, hey, why did I not put them in as squares or other transformations? And of course, they could have uh, been modeled in any kind of way. So as a consequence, you're essentially leaving out important confounders by specifying very simplistic models. And as a result, you will get, uh, even when there is no causal effect, you will, it will suggest there is a causal effect and you would reject the null of no causal effect. Uh, with probability tending to one, a sample size increases. So, <clears throat> and on top of that, it's actually uh, many times worse than this uh, because, um, yeah, like here it's, it's talking about this tissue system, you pour the data into a big, big pile of linear algebra and collect the answers on the other side. And what if the answers are wrong? Just steer the pile until they start looking right. Yeah, so this is. Uh, in many ways kind of happening consciously or unconsciously uh, because a priori specified models are hard to believe as well. So people kind of try to play and play some kind of detective uh, and, and, and find some results which make sense to them. And it doesn't necessarily mean they are bad people, but <laughs> it is just nothing to do with science anymore. It is, uh, and so this is a real problem. And so that's on top of the problems I already laid out. And so this has been recognized by many people, um, including you know, maybe especially Ian Is, who published this important article, why most published research findings are false. And there's another one here, statistical crisis in science. Um, Undisclosed flexibility in data collection and analysis allows presenting anything as significant. So, <clears throat> so this is the <clears throat> motivation uh, at the time to say, you know, let's stick to what the traditional roadmap of statistics was all about, and uh, and let's bring that back instead of uh, you know having walked this path of, yeah, uh, maybe inspired by the computers that we can run these things, but the people lost track of what they're actually doing. 
So what would be a sensible roadmap for doing statistical learning is, uh, is laid out here. We'll talk more about it, but uh, you define often your interest in some kind of causal question. Now for that, we nowadays have causal models. So you have the name and room model, you have the structure equation model, Perl and so on. So you have a way of in an underlying world where you collect the full data you really would have liked to collect such as for every person and uh, potential outcome in the treatment and potential outcome in the control. And you say, hey, I would like to know the difference of that and take the mean. That would be an example of a causal quantity defined in an underlying world where you have more data than you really did collect. Uh, but anyway, that's very helpful still uh, to allow you to have that language and to, to, uh, to discuss this with your collaborators and come to an agreement what is the kind of uh, question you really have. And then once you have that, you say, okay, let's now be realistic. We don't observe, uh, for example, the potential outcomes of the treatment and control. We only observe one of them. So there's really essentially some kind of missing is going on. And there might be all kinds of other issues, bias sampling or right censoring, dropout, you name it. So the question becomes from the actual observed data, experiment can we even learn this quantity we care about this quantity which is represented by a yeah, parameter of a full data distribution and that's called an identification question and and of course people statisticians and so on have thought about that and, and came up with assumptions such as coarsening at random missing at random sequential randomization assumption uh, and so on so that gives us fundamental theorems uh, and new theorems developed over time as well, all the time, uh, which say for this type of experiment with the following complexities, I can learn this kind of causal question under the following assumptions. And, and that if you then apply that result, you obtain a so-called estimate, something you can learn from the data. So now you have a causal quantity and you have an estimate, the closest statistical target. And if these assumptions are true, the identification assumption, then these two are equal. And so by going after this estimate, you're precisely going after the question you care about. On, on the other hand, there might be a causal gap, so to speak, and there might be some violation. And, and uh, yeah, till you might say, you know, this I don't trust it at all. It's too far from reality. And so maybe you just have to collect a better experiment or, or satisfy yourself with, you know, maybe not going after the most ambitious questions, whatever. But at some point, you say, yes, this is the estimate I want to go for. I believe the causal gap, let's say, is not too big. And so now the, the statistical estimation problem starts. And this is where you then, if you look at that statistical uh, estimate, you will see it depends on things like, you know, the, what happens in the uh, future given the past. It's that kind of conditional distribution you have to learn from your data, uh, certainly in causal inference. So you have to learn that, and how do you do that? Now, we want to do all this in the realistic assumptions, so we could then utilize machine learning. And so this is where we have now integrated by now causal models to define the causal question, identification uh, results to, to define estimates, and now machine learning to learn these conditional distributions of like the future given the past, which are necessary to evaluate your statistical estimate. Now, that is not enough. And that, uh, that would give you some kind of plug-in estimator, but it would not provide you inference. And that's why in machine learning, there was generally no inference. People thought if model selection uh, makes it hard to still do inference, and these kind of things. So that's where then <coughs> this uh, target learning comes in, is how do we construct uh, search plugin estimators based on machine learning, which actually provides valid inference. So they're as approximately normally distributed and so on. Now that's where statistical theory comes in, efficiency theory, empirical process theory, and so on. And, and that's where target mixed like estimator has been developed as, as, the, as a method to achieve this. And so it's a two-stage method. So that's the uh, general story. And uh, but notice here, we're trying to go through carefully through all the steps, understand the experiments, but only make assumptions which you believe to be true. And, um, and that's it. 
and actually define what you really care about. Um, now, targeted learning, uh, which you know I call this this field of constructing plugin estimators for estimates, uh, utilizing machine learning, so in other words, in realistic statistical models, we only make realistic assumptions. Uh, we, we wrote an important paper in 2006 on target mixed light estimator, and, and since then, you know, a lot of developments based on that PMLE principle. Um, and, and two books have been published, uh, one in 2011 and one in 2018. <clears throat> and we're also doing a lot of software development, a so-called TLverse is in uh, an R environment with lots of tools for targeted learning and very general tools, which can be utilized for any new software package. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this roadmap. So the roadmap of statistical learning is step one, you describe the experiment. Step two, you describe a statistical model. Step three, you describe a statistical estimate. Step four, you construct an estimator. It's an a priori specified algorithm. And step five, how are we going to obtain inference? And, uh, and then there might be a step six, which is getting into sensitive analysis. I won't talk about it uh, today. So let's do a particular example. And this is actually an example uh, um, concerning uh, the impact of steroids on mortality among septic shock patients. Uh, that was a question in the medical community. Should we be giving steroids to these patients who come in with septic shock? And then the outcome would be death a month later, because it's a very serious thing. So you either make it or you don't, essentially. And um, so yeah, so that's the data. And people were interested in that question and, and they started running randomized trials in particular. Uh, so in other words, should we just give antibiotics or also steroids? And this resulted in 32 randomized trials, but even a meta analysis of these randomized trials didn't show a significant impact using a standard difference in mean stuff. And so you can focus on three big RCTs within that group. And again, if you do a meta-analysis for them, you, of course, also don't find uh, with the standard methodology and significant results. So let's consider this uh, real problem. And let's go through the roadmap to address it. So here we have a sample of 1,300 patients. We collect baseline covariates, W we call it, steroid treatment, yes or no, we call it A, and we have an outcome Y, which is one month mortality. And, and of course, here in this case, we know uh, that treatment within each of these RCT was randomized, so that's knowledge, and that's like what knowledge you should incorporate in your statistical model. Now, a statistical model is about describing stochastic relations between your observed variables. And here you just see a picture of an, uh, an P0 being the true data distribution, so distribution of the data. And then a statistical model is a collection of possible distributions, and you would like to see that your true data distribution is in there. And that's what I call a realistic statistical model. And then, of course, if you think about the typical traditional paramedic models, Cox models and so on, uh, they are models which are guaranteed to not include this true data distribution. So you are guaranteed misspecified. And that's the difference between a realistic and a an, uh, non-realistic uh, statistical model. But anyway, the idea of statistical model is that it's truthful. And that has always been the idea in traditional statistics, except somehow it got lost. And so we have to go back to that. And that means we're not going to make parametric assumptions. We only make assumptions such as conditional independence assumptions, which are these type of things, or bounds, which are known to be true. And independence, of course, IID, these kind of assumptions, if they're realistic. So that's a statistical model. So that means you can write down your likelihood. And you can, um, in this case, you have a distribution of the covariates W and the condition distribution treatment A given W and the condition distribution of death Y given the treatment and the covariates. And uh, we now ask, what is the statistical query? And for that, we then, you know, typically first go through, uh, I don't, is do this causal model. And you might say, uh, I care about the average treatment effect, the mean of Y1 minus Y0. And 
and the question uh, and every human fate would be here to yeah, if everybody would get the steroids, what would be the proportion of that? And everybody gets the control, what would be the proportion of that? Let's take the different. Uh, that's, let's say, is your question of interest. And then uh, the question is, can we learn that from the data? Can we identify it? And you can identify it, uh, yes, under the assumption that treatment is randomized conditional on the covert. So your randomization problems can only be a function of observed variables. Okay, and that's true here. So we can identify it as an actual feature of the data distribution by the full emulation, which is the probability of death. Within every strain of covariates, you look at the probability of death among the treated, probability of death among the controls, and you take the difference of these two probabilities, and you average by the proportion of people in each strain. So that's this psi of P0, which is now an estimate. So it's a mapping, which takes a probability measure in the statistical model and maps it into a number. And so we now say, okay, that's our statistical question. That's the one we're trying, we, we want to address. So by now we have to find the statistical estimation problem. We have data, let's say IID. Uh, we have to find the statistical model, only making some independent assumption on treatments being randomized, so independent of the covariates, let's say. And we have uh, a statistical query. So now we need to come up with an uh, estimator, and that has to be a priori specified. And uh, that's an important piece here. And so, and it needs to respect the statistical model. And so, uh, target maximum light estimation is a methodology <coughs> which is uh, asymptotically efficient, so it has asymptotic optimality, uh, but it also has enormous finite sample robustness. Uh, and it works by, uh, by it's a two-stage method. You first uh, get an initial estimator of the conditional distributions in your data distribution. And so in this case, what do you need to learn? Uh, you need to learn the conditional probability of death given the treatment of the covariates and the distribution of the covariates. But the distribution of the covariates, you can take the empirical mean. So that's the easy part. So you really only have to learn the conditional distribution of the death given treatment and covariates. So that's how are you going to do that? Now, that's where we then can maybe use state-of-the-art machine learning. And for that, we have advertised super learning because of its uh, properties. It's just using cross-relation to select the best estimator among a big library of machine learning algorithms. And so this way, we can adapt and choose the right algorithm for our particular data set. And then comes the target maximum likelihood step, which uses the initial estimator as an offset and proposes a fluctuation of that offset with a certain parameter epsilon. If epsilon is zero, you get back your offset, your initial estimator, and if epsilon moves, you fluctuate it. And then that's just a little parametric model. And that parametric model is chosen clever uh, so that fitting the, tuning, the fluctuation parameter epsilon is like fitting the parameter of interest. Uh, so that targeted mix of likelihood step then really is going to remove a lot of bias of the initial estimate, which was just global machine learning, which was not having in mind yet what the target was, generally speaking. And so that's the two-stage procedure uh, where the initial estimate is updated to achieve an optimal bias variance trade. And these are can be analyzed and they're and they are also called asymptotically linear estimators. If your initial estimator is, is, a, is n to the minus a quarter rate of convergence, uh, and there are plug-in estimators, which is very important. Right? You just, as if you're going after difference of probabilities or probability, you will end up with different probability, contrary to many other estimators, like estimate equations or one-step estimates, which uh, are not generally even giving you uh, a valid probability, or, or they might not even give you a valid probability and thereby ignoring important global knowledge. So that's why plug-in estimation is important. That's what Max Weinberg was all about. You just estimate the density and you plug it in your target parameter. And this, this still does that, and that helps a lot. And, um, and due to the uh, targeting step, you now can prove that Target makes a light estimator, the plug-in estimator minus true behaves like an empirical mean. So it equals an empirical mean of a so-called influence curve, which is a function of the unit data structure, you know, WI, AI, YI here, and plus some second order term. 
and therefore you can analyze it as if it's a sample mean. You can calculate the, you can estimate the sample variance of the influence curve, and and then uh, you divide it by the sample size. You get the variance of the estimator approximately, and you can then construct confidence intervals. Which is the estimator plus or minus, let's say, one point nine six times the standard error estimator. And so what that's done here, and in this case, the target maximum estimator gives you confidence interval. And actually gives a significant result. And the reason why it's significant is because it was utilizing super learning. That means you have a covariance measured in this person at baseline, which can be very predictive, circle of a one month in the future outcome, like death or not. And so they really help you to improve efficiency. And because of the target max likelihood step, it doesn't matter that you take that risk of doing machine learning, uh, because the targeting step is going to remove the bias anyway. And, and, and so you do it in a completely robust, safe way, uh, and you get a gain in efficiency in randomized trials without any risk of non-valid inference. But there are common involves are might happen, like here. So, <clears throat> and so what the targeting step generally does is that when you look at the initial estimator, you would look at the sampling distribution, certainly if you, for all kinds of machine learning algorithms, it might not even look like a normal distribution. And even when it looks a little bit like a normal distribution, it will generally be biased, so it will not be centered nicely. And the TMLE step changes that sampling distribution from often from a non-normal, not even any limit distribution, to a approximately normal uh, mean zero, uh, in other words, centered around the truth uh, sampling distribution. In this uh, case, there's actually something interesting what was going on, uh, and that is that there is a binary variable, which is a response test, which was measured uh, on people. And for the responders, uh, the steroids was bad. And it's for the non-responders of the stress test, the steroid was good. And so that was really what was going on. And this also suggests then maybe we should have asked other questions, such as what is the optimal dynamic treatment? What's the optimal individualized treatment rule responding? Which, in other words, it's a rule which uses certain baseline cohorts, which you might a priori specify maybe including this stress that obviously, and say, what is the best rule uh, for assigning treatment or control depending on these variables? And, and then compare the mean outcome under using that rule in your uh, in practice versus that's always control. If you would have done that, you would have had a lot of power. There wouldn't have been any cancellation, like there is in the average treatment effect. And so, and these are things we can do too. And there's a lot of literature on that as well, in particular TMLE and CVTMLE for going after uh, the mean outcome and their estimate of an optimal dynamic trip. So these are things we can do too in RCTs. And here it would have been, uh, of course, very, uh, the right thing to do. Okay, so let's, uh, so that is the whole story about the roadmap. And, uh, I want to discuss a little bit these kind of the target mix of likelihood has two ingredients. One is super learner, and one is the target mix of likelihood step. Uh, what is uh, the idea of super learner? It's very trivial in a sense. You just say, okay, uh, we're going to use cross validation. So we have a library of candidate machine learning algorithms. Uh, so here depicted here with linear models and Bayesian regression trees and so on. And you say, let's have an internal competition. Uh, to choose among them. So in other words, run them on 9 tenths of the data, like a training data set, and evaluate how well they actually predict on the left out uh, patients, let's say in this case, uh, and, and then use that as a measure of performance and then do it in a tenfold way so that we are uh, utilizing, so we're not relying on a particular split into one tenth, nine tenths, every person is also entering up in the ending up in the validations, in the A validation set. So then uh, you have now a cross-validated, uh, like mean squared error, cross-validated log likelihood as a measure of performance for each candidate algorithm, uh, which just says, OK, for, for a particular algorithm, if I train you on 90 of the data, how well does it predict on the left out there? And you can then say, let's use the winner. And that's called the discrete super learner. And you can also say, let's go for the best a weighted combination of these algorithms, and that will be like a convex superlar. And more generally, you can do some more other types of meta-learning algorithms.
algorithms because the whole idea is that you create a meta level data set uh, where you have a column which is the outcome column still with n observations and then the covariates become the candidate algorithms trained on the corresponding training data so thereby sort of excluding that particular observation yi and so you then have a meta level data set where the covariates become predictions from candidate algorithm but always crossfit and you say hey you know i could have used linear regression at the meta level or convex regression but maybe i can use something else as well and that's it yeah, gets then into general meta learning algorithms but either way the important thing is uh, if you use cross validation uh, it has an oracle involved and that's something we showed in 2003 and so on uh, that you can show that the cross validation selector does as well as the oracle selector as long as the number of candidate estimates among which you choose is polynomial and sample size. And as long as the loss function is uniformly bounded. And, and so that is a very yeah, sensible assumption, right? If your loss is unbounded or can be very large, then you have like one outlier can completely change the cross validated risk of an algorithm. And of course, it becomes unreliable. So it's a very sensible assumption, uh, but it was an assumption which was not recognized. People kind of solve things, problems with cross-validation, and they thought, oh, cross-validation doesn't work well. It's just another method. But of course, the problem was this, that you need to assume a bounded loss function, and then you can prove you know, oracle inequality and everything is great. And so it is truly an asymptotically optimal way of choosing among tuning parameters or Canada algorithms in general. And uh, so that's really why we called it super learner because it teaches us this is the way we have to do it if we care about truly the best algorithm for our particular data set. And that's also probably the reason why in many competitions, it's these algorithms which win the competition. Here you can see why, why does super learner win these competitions. Now here's an example of public 15 publicly available data sets. You have here the super learner, discrete super learner, super learner is the convex one, discrete is just choosing the best. And here are these algorithms which were all in the library. And then here's the relative mean squared error relative to GLM. And so, uh, so here are 15 data sets, and this one was you know, better than GLM, and this one's worse, and so on. But anyway, and then there is the average of your relative mean squared error, and that's how it's ranked. And you see that uh, the best performance has the super learner, and then Bayesian regression trees is number three, and so on. But what is, of course, happening if you lose Bayesian regression trees, that's really what makes the super learner, let's say, very good in this case. However, there's one data set where it does poorly. And of course, in that case, the super learner wouldn't have chosen it. And so it's still fine. And that's similar with things like random forest. Maybe it was good for certain data sets, but very poor for others. So the cross relation would have said, don't use it. And therefore, you're fine. And so across many data sets, you will see a super learner starts winning relative to any fixed algorithm. Of course, the stronger the library, the stronger the super learner. So the super learner is just a way that we, as a whole community, can create very powerful algorithms by incorporating each of the algorithms proposed by people and make it uh, more powerful than all its parts. Still, if you want to claim that the super learner has a certain rate of convergence, you want to make sure that there's at least one estimator in your library of algorithms converges at a rate faster than n to the quarter, because that's necessary for claiming the target maximal likelihood as product efficient and so on, and also claiming for prediction that you actually converge to the true function at a reasonable rate. And for that, we developed uh, the highly adaptive lasso, uh, which is made uh, based on the following observation that any d dimensional uh, right continuous left hand limit function. So it's not even necessarily a small function, can be represented as an infinite linear combination of spline basis functions, which are indicators that x1 is bigger than a cutoff. And if it's, if it's a function x1 and x2, you get indicators of x1 bigger than a cutoff, indicates x2 bigger than a cutoff, and also the product of that. And so you get these tens of products of you know, what we call zero order splines, just simple functions which jump at a particular null point from zero to one just indicators. And so any cat-like -like function can be written as a infinitesimal linear combination of such things. And that then suggests, hey, <clears throat> think of that then 
And then the other uh, piece of this is that the actual coefficients, if you look at the L1 norm of the coefficients in that infinite linear equation, that is actually something you can think of as a so-called variation norm of the function. So it's a real measure of complexity. And, uh, and so this general representation of cat-like -like functions uh, tells us, hey, why are we not maximizing the log likelihood or minimizing the sum of squared residuals over all cat-like -like functions with a certain variation norm bounded by some m? And because of this representation, it will then correspond with optimizing over a linear model in these tensor product of indicated basis functions uh, under the constraint that the L1 norm is bounded by that bound on the variation norm. And so it becomes what we call lasso, except it's a high dimensional lasso with lots of uh, basis functions and, and, and as, as many as n times 2 to the power d. And so this we call highly adaptive lasso. And we can then prove that this algorithm actually converges to the true function uh, with respect to loss based dissimilarity, like Kubak Leitner and L2 norm, really, generally speaking, at a rate as fast as n to the minus one third up to log n factors. And that is remarkable because, number one, that means whatever the dimension is of the function we're going after, we always get a rate faster than n to the quarter. Essentially, it doesn't even depend on the dimension. The rate is very good. And so this gives us now, if we include highly adaptive loss, so in our algorithm, in our library of the super learner, we are guaranteed that the super learner goes at least as fast as this algorithm. And, uh, and that will then guarantee that the target makes the right best measure are asymptotically efficient and all that, and, theory, and the theory applies and so on. And uh, an highly adaptive loss, so is not just a theoretical algorithm, it's actually a remarkably powerful algorithm. There's a lot to talk about, about highly adaptive loss, so, and I don't have time for that, but it's a remarkable algorithm. It's really the kind of non-paramedic maximum like estimates you can, you would desire. Uh, you can prove, for example, that highly adaptive loss, so itself is essentially efficient if you undersmooth it. And, and so it's, it has remarkable properties, uh, just like paramedic maximum like, but now for realistic models. And also here is just a simulation where you compare it gradient boosting random forest and across a few dimensions. Uh, in this case, uh, dimension was free, uh, but there, we did went through all the dimensions from one to seven. And, uh, and you see that highly vector loss so does actually very well across these different data sets. And, um, and certainly it starts getting better and better relative to other algorithms when the dimension grows and also what is, uh, uh, yeah, dimension in particular. And this is very general. So this is not just something you can do for regression. You can do it for anything, right? In particular, here's an example of, uh, like, suppose you have right sense of survival data, covert treatment, and right sense survival data. And you want to learn the conditional hazard of the failure time given the treatment and the covariance. Now, you can represent a hazard, like the walk of a hazard as a as uh, linear form. So in other words, the hazard is e to the power of a linear combination of these tens of products of indicated basis functions, so which are these zero order splines. And so we get then essentially some kind of Cox model, except it's not Cox, we don't make the proportional assumption, but you just get, uh, and then you say, I'm going to maximize my log likelihood over all beta under the constraint that the L1 norm of beta is smaller than uh, some constant, and that of course is going to be tuned with cross validation. And so this is actually something which is also implemented in GLM-Net. And so you can then use this highly adaptive loss of estimator with standard software uh, uh, to fit it. And then have that guaranteed rate of convergence, which is a rate of convergence which even applies when the function makes jobs, right? So it's not even that it has to be continuous or smooth. The other thing is with uh, that you can also, when you do the super learner, as I said, there's a meta level data set uh, where the covariates become the predictions, cross-fitted predictions of the different algorithms. You can, you could say, I'm going to use the lasso there. I'm going to use, and so we have been working on a so-called meta whole super learner, meta highly adaptive lasso super learner, where we actually use highly adaptive lasso under different L1 arms uh, at the meta level. And then of course, really embed this in a discrete super learner where the, where essentially the algorithms are themselves super learner with different meta learning algorithms going from non-aggressive to very aggressive, 
and then just choose with the cross race like which one is the best and then we have the guaranteed robustness and from the oracle inequality which will make sure we are not going too aggressive and we actually do the right thing and so that's another way uh, that even when your candidate algorithms are kind of too biased you would still because of the meta level learning being very aggressive you could still get the perfect uh, performance anyway so the second uh, thing is then the target mix light estimator. What's the idea there? Now, the idea of the target mix light estimator is, think of it this way. If, if I uh, already have done my machine learning fit of my conditional probability of death as a function of treatment and covariance, you might say, hmm, if I just add a covariance and use it as offset, I get an extra fitting going on. Right? So maybe increase the likelihood a little bit. So there are lots of possible coverage you could add. But at the end, you are going to use that prediction function to evaluate the prediction and the treatment and control for every person, take the difference and average. So you have a very specific purpose for this prediction function, namely go after the average treatment effect. And so really what you like to see is that as you increase the likelihood, it corresponds to the maximal change in the estimate, so-called plug -in estimate. And that's precisely what this target mix like step is. It's looking for this little parametric model like in this case, adding a covariate, choosing a covariate in such a way that S, that for every unit increase in likelihood along this simple one-dimensional parametric model, we get a maximal change in the estimate. And so here would be two examples of a wrong parametric model to do your TMLE step and a correct one. And the correct one is the one where this is the steeper slope. right? As you, for every increase in the likelihood, as you compute the maximal likelihood estimator for epsilon is zero to to your actual MLE, you will get the maximal benefit from your fitting for the purpose of what you care about. And that's why you can think of that target mix like a step as 100% focused on utilizing the data to fit your estimate of interest. And uh, to see that in action, <clears throat> not just in action, but the general idea of how to construct uh, such a uh, yeah, what we call least favorable parametric model um, is uh, now many problems is actually easy like in the average shear effect is just adding like an indicator of treatment divided by the score uh, minus the indicator of non-treatment divided by one minus Penzi score but anyway and so but there, there's a very general way to construct this kind of uh, least favorable model in the optimal way and that's what we uh, that worked on in 2015, what we call the one-step TMLE. And just to demonstrate that, uh, is uh, let's do right sensitive survival data. We talked about that. And suppose you care about understanding the probability, the survival function of the potential outcome under a dynamic treatment D. And uh, you can then identify that under the randomization assumption and positivity assumption, and it would be this probability of the survival time exceeding t uh, given w and a follows the rule, and then average over w. And so this would be your, your statistical estimate, which would be equal to your target quantity uh, if these assumptions are true. And also that centering is, of course, also uh, the coursing are random. Now let's for simplicity focus on the, you know, the static treatment. And notice this is of course a whole curve or it could just be a survival function at a point. So I might call it SDT to indicate that this is a potentially causal object. It's a counterfactual survival curve at time t. And so when you have an estimate and you have a statistical model, you have your knowledge about what you, what you know, and it might be very little. It might just be IID, let's say. But then you can work out the so-called efficient image curve. Now, the efficient image curve is an object in efficiency theory, but what it really is, is you calculate the so-called pathwise derivative of this estimate, which means you take paths through P and you compute the psi of that, P, let's say P epsilon is the path where epsilon zero goes through P, you take the dd epsilon of psi of p epsilon, you express it as a linear operator in the score of the path, uh, which is like the dd epsilon of the epsilon. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, by the reason representation theorem, you can also write this in the inner product because scores live in a Hilbert space with, let's say, the covariance as the inner product. 
And so in this way, you, uh, you can write your pathwise derivative as an inner product a covariance of a gradient with the score. And then one of the gradients you're looking for is the so-called canonical gradient, <coughs> which is the score itself. It's, it's, so in other words, it needs to be chosen so that it's in the space of the scores from your statistical model, the so-called tangent space. And that's called the canonical gradient. And so that's just an exercise. You have to do for every statistical model and statistical tar parameter, you compute this pathwise derivative of the tar parameter as a mapping from the model to, let's say, the real line. And then you find a canonical gradient. And the canonical gradient, like in this case, would be this object. We call it D star P. It depends on at what P you do it and what your tar parameter is. You know, that was a survivor at time T, so that also depends on T. And then these canonical rates are scores. So what, as you will, what you will see is that, for example, in this case, it looks like a time-dependent covariate times an indicator <coughs> of having a failure and time uh, k observed filter, and then uh, minus the, yeah, the residual, the, the regression, the conditional probability of that. And that's the hazard. And then here's a function of the covariates, uh, and that's also a score. It's a function of w with mean zero. So you have your efficiency curve has these two components. One has to do it's a score for the distribution of W, and this is a score for the conditional yeah, the hazard, the hazard of T given A W. And, and this score is of the form of covariate times residual. And, and here's the so-called clever covariate. <coughs> and then once you have the efficiency curve, you can say, I want to construct a path. A parametric model which has a score, like coefficient epsilon, which has a score the canonical rate. Now, and that's precisely what a least stable path is. That's the one where you get for unit increase in likelihood maximum change in the estimate. And so in this case, it will be a logistic regression. Let's say if we do discrete survival time, and you just uh, add as covert epsilon times this time-dependent covert. And that will be your so-called local, I would call it local least favorite model, because it's only doing the optimum. It has the maximal, has this property of maximal change in estimate for unit increase, like it only locally at epsilon is zero. Uh, but we want it to be not just great in the beginning, when epsilon is very small, because maybe the initial estimate is far away. So we want it to be always go in the steepest direction of maximal change in the estimate. And so what you can do then, uh, you can just say, I'm going to use as path, tracking this local least favorable path locally. In other words, I make a small move epsilon, make that my new offset, then again use this local least favorable path, recompute your clever covariate, which is now slightly different, but you change your offset, and move again in this direction. And so you keep moving in very small steps, always in the perfect direction. So you only use the local least favorite path locally. And in this way, you create a new path, a new path. Uh, and, um, and that is what we call the universal least favorable path. That path you can prove has the property that it's not just at epsilon is zero. It's, it's, it has a maximal change in estimate for unit increase in likelihood. But at any epsilon, wherever you're on the path, it's always going for maximal fitting for the target estimate. And so this is also the reason why the max, if you now do make some likelihood along this new path, <coughs> your TMLE will be in one step uh, done, and we call it the one step TMLE. And it will be maximally robust targeting step. Now, we also have done this for continuous time. There are several papers of interest by Elaine Breitkart and myself on um, general longitudinal and continuous time uh, TMLE. Uh, anyway. So, so that's the general team lead we can always do the most robust targeting step. Um, here was a simulation by David Bankster where we said, okay, since we now have highly adaptable, so why don't we do a simulation where we randomly sample data distribution with all kinds of crazy functions for the treatment mechanism, the outcome reaction, and then just throw the super learner at it with highly adaptable so in there, run the TMLE and say, hey, how does this behave? So this is now an honest simulation. Uh, in the sense that you cannot cheat. The highly depth also doesn't care anyway what you, if it's smooth or not, it just goes its way. And in this simulation, we saw remarkable performance up to you know, dimensions 10 even, 
uh, were because of the high depth of the soil, including it in the super or even high depth of the soil by itself, you get very robust inference, even in these uh, yeah, completely blind simulations where you generate randomly sampled data distributions, which can be uh, all kinds of complex forms. Uh, so to get back to applications in genomics, uh, Generally speaking, the main twist is that you are, have many questions in genomics. And so what you can do, you can many times define these kind of causal estimates from the causal literature, except you define it for every gene or every biomarker or whatever. And so here's an example of 800 patients in an emergency room with all kinds of variables. It also measured over different time points. And you want to know which variables are most predictive or most important for uh, the outcome of interest. And uh, you then have to define, how do you define for every variable A, let's say, how do you define its yeah, measure, its effect, or its measure of association? And then you can grab one of these quantities from the causal literature, like this is the causal effect of a shift in the intervention for continuous treatment, and, and it's defined in this way. And so we have a TMLE for that, and there's an R package as well for this TMLE shift. And so you can then run for every continuous variable, maybe it's a gene expression, whatever it is, you can run this target maxillary estimator, get a cons interval, get a p-value, and, and do it across many. And then we can also do multiple testing, even taking into account the correlation between all these test statistics. And uh, in particular, you can then make nice pictures with effect sizes, positive, negative, and how significant they are. <coughs> Similar, uh, this is for target mixed light for genomic data. Uh, this was Yu Wang at the time, a postdoc. Uh, the original paper, they, they were interested in this associated genes for spina bifida. And in the original paper, they ran univariate regressions. They missed some important ones. And often with univariate regression, you select too many. So there are lots of false positives. And uh, so we did actually target mixed light estimate where for every SNP, you do a separate target mixed light estimate for the, like the average treatment effect of that SNP having a yes or no controlling for other uh, confounders, including the neighboring uh, SNPs. And uh, yeah, you have to make it scalable. So, so there are some. Uh, things you can do there. And then you can make again, you know, a nice picture where you plot, like in this case, the p-value across the whole genome, and you can see which ones pop up as important. And, and this gives some interesting results. Uh, you could also incorporate some ideas from uh, Smith 2004, where you, when you create these t-statistics, that you kind of make them, uh, the standard errors more robust so by pulling it towards an overall mean. And you can still do that, except the standard errors are not coming from the sample variance of the influence curve of your TMLE. Uh, but anyway, that's still what you do. You create an estimator divided by the standard error, which is nothing else than the sample variance of the influence curve, uh, square root. And so you can still use these ideas, and that's you know, we have done, and that's implemented in this bio TMLE R package to create uh, kind of these robust uh, multi, yeah, multi. Uh, uh, multiple testing type uh, genomic analysis where, for example, uh, there's a treatment, maybe it's some kind of treatment, and maybe the outcome is, in this case, um, maybe you looked at the outcome was an overall gene expression profile or the outcome might be an overall brain image. And you want to understand the impact of the treatment, the exposure maybe to benzene or something on uh, each of these, uh, these big multivariate outcome process uh, in space or in time or across the genome. And, um, and so you get, uh, again, running many TMLE simultaneously uh, with inference. And so you can then learn what works. And here's a simulation, uh, and then comparing it in particular, if you would have focused on something like linear regression, that you really do a much better job in picking up the true guys and, and also avoiding the false positives. And so that's uh, the story. A yeah, final remark, which I think is interesting as well, we also have proposed so-called data adaptive target parameters where you say, look, many times we don't really know yet what our question of interest is. We want to kind of mine the data and figure out 
what's really the question of interest for us. And so in that sense, we proposed a framework where you define what we call data adaptive target problems. That means you run an algorithm, you propose an algorithm, uh, which when you run it on the data, it spits out a supposed uh, estimate of interest. So it might be something like one example would be, you run a machine learning on like a super learner for learning an optimal dynamic treatment. And then what, whatever it spits out, you say, now I want to know the mean outcome of this estimate of the optimal dynamic treatment relative to control. Or maybe you, you're interested in, you have multiple psychological scores uh, instruments, and you kind of want to combine them. You want to know what the effect of the drug is on some kind of weighted average of all these psychological uh, scores. And then maybe learn from the data how to average it and then define that parameter. So these are all examples of uh, data adaptive target parameters you might be interested in. And how can you still get inference in this case? And, uh, and that's possible. And that's for that we have proposed cross-validated target mix line estimator. So in other words, you run on nine ten of the data, your algorithm which generates your parameter of interest. And then you say, oh, now I know what my parameter of interest, let me now do the TMLE, except what I'm going to do, I'm getting my initial estimator still from the training sample, but only the targeting step is done on the separate sample to remove the bias. And that is then actually, it avoids the complete sample splitting, which is a big price to pay by only doing the sample splitting at the targeting level. And that happens to work under essentially no assumptions. So anyway, that was it. And um, yeah, we are involved in uh, also the Sentinel project, safety analysis and so on uh, of these applications of targeted learning in the in the real world. So thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Professor Van der Lund, for a fantastic talk. Actually, I believe this talk is very much relevant and very important, even from undergraduate to postdoc levels. So, anyone has any question? Please, uh, we have some time for question. Thank I have you. a question for Mark. <laughs> Please uh, go ahead, Michael. Here, a uh, wonderful talk, hey, Mark. So uh, this one tenth, nine tenth fold business is there? What what is that the the way to do it? One tenth, nine tenth, or is there is there any gaming of that? People game that at all, or is there optimal fractions, or does it depend on n? Or yeah, I mean it's an interesting question. I mean the theory uh, from the fee fold cross relation is. The, is that you really want the validation sample to start growing towards an infinite sample. So right. it avoids the leave one out. So the theory we developed is not doing leave one out, even though you know nowadays we also have results for online cross-validation, which is close to leave one out. Uh, but it's anyway, it's more for time series. Um, but yeah, so then the next question is, is there, uh, you certainly don't want to do single split. Right? The default is much better. And that's also what you see in a finite sample. Uh, is there, uh, is there a lot of room to improve by choosing the proportion? I, mean, I, I still think that's, uh, I mean, you can show that then. Uh, V-fold is in first order optimal if you believe in that proportion. So the real question then beyond that becomes how do you choose your proportion? And you were asking uh, why 10-fold, why not 20-fold? And yeah. I mean, generally speaking, I think Leo Bryman liked tenfold based on his experience. Uh, we noticed with small samples, twin higher folds moving towards more like leave one out is actually better. So I think there are interesting questions there. Uh, of um, but generally speaking, yeah, we have some rules of thumbs in our mind. And again, if I have thirty-two uh, observations, then I use leave one out. But generally speaking, when the sample size gets quite reasonable. Tenfold is a good choice. Uh, that's our experience. Thanks a lot. It's terrific work. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, any, any other question? Uh, but I, I, I just want to uh, have actually confirmed my understanding about kind of uh, philosophy. When you at the very beginning of the of your talk, you mentioned step one, step two, step three, like that, right? Uh, that how to formulate mm -hmm. the entire procedure, analysis procedure. So uh, I'm wondering that uh, I believe that when we are in the step three, like when we are going to define the statistical query, uh, probably we have to again go back to step one to understand the objective, the description and the hypothesis. And then again, we have to 
That means there should be kind of moving between these steps, right? Within these steps. I think what you're getting at is that uh, that you, when you go through this roadmap, you say this is my quantitative interest, like some kind of causal effect, and then you you go to your data and you address the identification question, and then you realize what assumptions you need to identify that causal quantity. You might actually say, you know, darn, these electronic health record data, I really don't trust my assumptions. I need these free notes from the doctor's notes. Uh, you know, I need language processing to bring them in because otherwise I don't trust my uh, randomization assumption. Uh, that means at that moment you say, I'm not going on. I am going to work harder to make my experiment uh, satisfy these causal assumptions by better approximation. So I'm going to collect more data. And so that's where you have a little feedback loop. But at some point you say, okay, this is it. This is my experiment. This is the data. I am happy with my estimate. I think it's not too bad. I'm moving on. I'm going to get inference for this estimate. And uh, there's still a way to link it, even when there is a causal gap towards causal conclusions through a sensitive analysis. By essentially for every assumed causal gap, providing the confidence interval for the causal quantity. And then you just have to think about hmm, what kind of causal gaps uh, are reasonable. So, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, I believe, uh, so let's thank Professor Van der Lem for his fantastic and very deep talk. Uh, so yeah, thanks so much. I really appreciate it.